This is a line from my admissions essay, and it reads, the new school presents a significant opportunity to conquer my professional, intellectual, and creative endeavors. I think it's very important, and this is something that the new school for social research and the new school more broadly gave me, um, is this idea of being a scholar activist or activist scholar, that the theoretical and the scholarly is always connected to the practical component of actually um, making a difference. I was born in Germany to an Iranian father and a German mother, which significantly shaped uh, my personal experience in terms of majority-minority relations, but um, also as a scholar. My focus was specifically on the Middle East and women's rights, trying to figure out what I can do or what society can do to actually fix these issues. In my dissertation, um, I examine how Muslim immigration has shaped state religion relations in Germany and the U.S. I think what really sets the New School for Social Research apart um, is its critical and innovative and also interdisciplinary focus. I wanted to have these options as a PhD student. I've taken courses ranging from Fanon and decolonization to basic courses on Marx and Hegel uh, to more practical courses such as quantitative and qualitative statistics as well as ethnographic research. And it was this wide range of courses from very theoretical scholarship to the more practical aspects of it that have informed my dissertation but also my, my research now which is very much a mixed method approach. When I came here I expected a lot of questions questions and critical thinking, and that's exactly what I found. Um, and what this really has helped me do as a scholar is to be critical of my own work, of other people's work, and just to not stop questioning. Hi all, we're going to get started and then there'll be more time for food and drinks. Uh, my name is Dana Messenger, I'm Director of Admissions at the New School for Social Research. Um, every year I feel like I tell students that they should be proud that they were admitted um, and that the class was really outstanding. And I think this year I um, feel so strongly that the quality of the applications were so high and so much stronger than I've seen in past years. And it's really exciting to read, really exciting to talk with you all and to meet you all. I know the faculty were also really thrilled by um, the students that they've admitted and the classes they are excited to work with next year. So I want to congratulate you, welcome you. Um, and we're going to begin. We're going to begin with Dean Will Milberg, who is also a professor of economics and co-chair of the Hal Brenner Center of Ca on, in Capitalism Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Well, welcome everybody to the New School for Social Research. And uh, as dean, I am just thrilled, thrilled to have you here and look forward to having you part of our community in the fall. And uh, this is a pretty intense place to do your graduate work. It's right in the middle of Manhattan. It's got scholars who are deeply engaged in their research. And it is enmeshed in a very lively university. So welcome. It's a place that you will both enjoy and you will contribute to when you come here. We are uh, a university, that's Ann Stoller by the way, who does not lecture from standing on a, on a desk, but who um, will be giving, by the way this is news, will be giving the graduation speech this year as our faculty speaker from the Department of Anthropology. The new school is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. And uh, it is, you know, what I'd like to say in my, in my couple minutes in front of you here is that um, one of the things that I've been very proud of as a professor of economics here for, for over 20 years and now dean for six years is the ability to ask important, persistent questions about social life and to continually renew the questions and the answers to those. So to revisit old texts, to think about the problems of the day in the context of the classic texts around social theory and philosophy, but also in the newest light facing the problems of the moment. So it's a place deeply engaged in questions of social justice, but also a place deeply engaged in social theory. And in this celebration of the centennial, uh, what I like to say is that the newest work and some of the best work raises some of the canonical questions that we asked at our founding. 
And I have here just uh, three books that came out this year uh, or in the last year um, by our faculty, or in the case on the left, a former dean who wrote a history of the new school that just came out recently, um, asking about questions of exile and our own founding as the university in exile. The book in the middle, I see the author in the back row, Jim Miller, uh, about the question of democracy. Can it work? And what does the emergence of populism and challenge, authoritarian challenges to democracy mean for us today in light of history? And then on the right is Dick Bernstein's book, Why Read Hannah Arendt Now? And of course, Hannah Arendt was a faculty member here, but more importantly, was a major philosopher and political thinker about questions of citizenship, statelessness, and the future of the, the polity. So those are new books asking questions that continue to engage us, drawing very much on the history of social thought. And they represent really the best of what what we do here at the New School for Social Research. You will be challenged, and yet uh, you will be asked to uh, not only learn the classic in your discipline, the classics in your discipline, but then to move the conversation forward. And the people around you, in the chairs around you now, are going to be the people that move you forward in that process. So it's a really exciting place to be. I would say, I'm, I'm actually going to move quickly. We are founded, of course, it, our, our own graduate school is founded in 1933 as a, as a university in exile. And we have recently set up a consortium, very recently, a consortium called the New University in Exile Consortium, which brings together now 14 universities, each of whom has an exiled scholar uh, hosted, and which brings them together in some kind of conversation at the new school. So our old tradition of hosting exiled scholars has now been renewed again in 2019. What is social research now? Well, again, uh, to repeat myself, it is the attempt to ask big questions and not just accept the given answers to them. And I, you know, we overuse probably this word interdisciplinary, but I think there is a great emphasis at the New School for Social Research in bringing together history, social theory, understanding of institutions and dynamics of, uh, of capitalism and democracy, which are necessarily across disciplines together to answer these big questions. What is populism? How do we understand the populist wave? That's uh, Professor Jessica Pisano lecturing on the topic. And, uh, it's a question that we take up with respect to many regions of the world, because now that is an issue relevant to many regions of the world. We have confronted questions of migration and mobility in our new institute, Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility, capitalism and the study of the forces of, and dynamics of capitalism in a very interdisciplinary way at the Heilbrunner Center, and finally, our Graduate Institute of Design, Ethnography, and Social Thought, which combines not only this kind of fairly intense social theory approach of the New School for Social Research, but brings it together with this very strong design school that we have at the Parsons School of Design. So it's a graduate institute which tries to combine the two and to talk about ethnography not just as a way of looking at clothing or, or material objects, but also as a way of understanding society. We are global. We have uh, students, as you will meet, from around the world. We have graduates now who have been placed around the world. We have centers in various locations around the world. And we are very proud of the kind of global perspective that we bring. Um, and, oops, this is not moving. There we go. Those are our alums. I want to get to some of our alums. Our India-China Institute, our Trans-Regional Center for Democratic Studies, which runs uh, institutes in uh, both Eastern Europe and previously in South Africa. That's the NSSR Europe and Joburg. And then, of course, uh, our Janey program in Latin American Studies. And we have a very strong tradition of both training students from Latin America and placing students both in academia and in government programs, both in South and North America. So what, 
What we do next is new programs, and there are some new programs that you should know about. Our creative journalism, uh, creative publishing and critical journalism program, which is a master's program. If you're here for that, we have the director here who also wrote the book on democracy. We have a wonderful online presence in the form of something called Public Seminar, and Public Seminar uh, draws on our tradition of interdisciplinary discussion, debate, and it has reached a very global audience and engages both our students, our faculty, and our friends around the world. And we have uh, a new summer institute, the Institute for uh, Critical Social Inquiry, which meets every summer in our university center and always features very prominent scholars on social theory, issues of race, issues of globalization, issues of critique. And we're very proud of uh, the success of that institute in the last two or three years. Our graduates, since our students from, are from around the world, our graduates tend to also be around the world. And we are very proud of both our ability to produce top-rate scholars who get placed in excellent universities and colleges, and also, as I say, leaders around the world. And we're very proud of both the academic and the non-academic placement record that we have. Uh, some of those people, I will mention, two economics graduates, one on top who's getting a lot of attention now and is actually teaching, I didn't see her tonight, but she's teaching a course here this semester, uh, Stephanie Kelton, who was Bernie Sanders chief economist and is in the press all the time now for her modern monetary theory. Heather Boucher was, was the Clinton, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, economic advisor. Um, Lisa Grande was the deputy, is still the special representative to the UN mission for Iraq. Uh, Ed Ochoa is the president of California State University, Monterey Bay, former second, uh, assistant secretary of post-secondary education in the Obama administration. These are all people who spent a number of years here studying, deeply engaged, continue to be engaged with us very, uh, very much so. Welcome to the New School for Social Research. And you have a great panel tonight and also lots and lots of resources to draw on and I think some drinks as well. Good luck. Thank you. And I want to invite Jay Bernstein, who's a distinguished professor of philosophy, up. So, so welcome. Uh, I think my task is to say something about graduate student life here, what it's like, what you can expect. Um, so I'll talk about the philosophy department, because it's what I know. But that story can be repeated for each of the departments here. And of course, to really know about what life is like, like a graduate student, do ask the graduate students who are here. They are the best source. But let me, let me just say something about what we try to do and, and the kind of environment that, at least in the philosophy department, we try to produce. Um, as a philosophy department, we are a pluralist department. Uh, and pluralism is rare in the academic world. That is, we care about the history of philosophy. We care about continental philosophy. We care about post-analytic uh, Anglo-American philosophy. And we care terribly about political and social philosophy. Every year, we try to uh, have an incoming group of 20 to 25 students. That's kind of the goal. And if you think about it, that means that at any given time, there's going to be somewhere between 60 and 75 students taking courses. So this is a large, exciting community. And we try to put on between 12 and 14 courses a semester. Uh, and we do not allow ourselves to repeat courses. So over the course of two years, an MA student will have a chance to choose between 40 and 50 different courses. Um, so what do our graduate students do? I want to talk about just what they've done over the past month, because it's pretty spectacular. So, there are a series of groups in the department, one of which, P, 
PSWIP, which is People's Society for Women in Philosophy, two weeks ago had their annual lecture. And you might think philosophy, annual lecture, women, not a big deal. Well, the speaker was Andrea Long Chu. And if you know her article on liking women, which went viral in N plus one, you'll know she's one of the most interesting feminist thinkers around. And sure enough, we had a fire hazard. We squeezed, what, 120 to 130 people into a room. It was a New York City event. Uh, scholars from Northwestern were there, from Rutgers, from NYU, from Columbia. This is an important young thinker who was brought here. And this was really, in a way, her coming out with her new work which is coming out in Verso uh, in October, called Females, a Radical Thinker. Peace Whip also is relaunching a journal uh, in a month's time. Uh, so uh, a chance for feminist philosophical writing to occur. But that's not the only journal in the philosophy department. For the last 40 years, the Graduate Faculty Philosophy Journal, which is one of the most known philosophy journals in the country doing work on continental philosophy. Everybody thinks the department does it. It does not. This is done wholly and solely by graduate students. It is edited, organized, everything about it is done by our graduate students. So two journals. What else? Well, this week, if you hang around for Thursday and Friday, uh, they have a yearly conference, a graduate uh, student conference, with two speakers. And graduate students from literally throughout the country and from Europe, from Paris and France and England this year, I saw come. So our graduate students are giving papers, editing journals, organizing conferences. Um, they are active in all the ways necessary to, to imagine, as it were, a life in philosophy. What else do they do? Well, the graduate students from the New School in Columbia decided that German idealism, well, there are not many German idealists. <laughs> so the students from the New School in Columbia got together, and I guess about 10 years ago, began the New York German Idealism Workshop, which meets once a month at either here or at uh, Columbia and has the leading historians of philosophy working on German thought, German idealism, attend. It's, it's an event now that is known throughout the country. Everybody wants to speak at it. Um, it's, so this is all stuff the graduate students do. This is all the stuff. And I won't say all the things we have talks every Thursday night. We have other conferences throughout the year, and on it goes. How closely uh, do we work with our students? Well, of course, some people in psychology work very closely with their students. They share a lab. Um, I uh, teach a course. Uh, a university lecture course on aesthetics, and I have six TAs. And every Monday night throughout the semester, my TAs come to my home, and we talk philosophy for three hours. Uh, and they shape my lectures. They change the course. And they become experienced in both teaching and understanding what it's like to run a large course. How about intellectually? I gave a, we had a conference this 
past weekend, another conference, uh, honoring a former colleague, Yuri Yovel, um, who was a great historian. And just at this conference, there were wonderful papers on Kant and Hegel and Spinoza and Freud. Indeed, the most beautiful Spinoza paper I ever heard. It, 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 it related Spinoza to the problem of original sin and the Garden of Eden and him solving that problem. But I gave a paper on Hegel. And in it, I had to acknowledge that my thought had changed radically on Hegel. And it changed radically on Hegel because uh, of the work of three of my graduate students. So one, Rossio Zambrana, has published a book on Hegel's logic. She now teaches at the University of Oregon. A second, Karen Ng, teaches at Vanderbilt and has a book coming out on Hegel and the problem of life. And a current graduate student, Anna Katzman, has a book coming out on Hegel and f logic and phenomenology. My, I said, and I believe, that these three young women will change the understanding of Hegel in America. That is, our students get involved in projects that we share with them, that they go out and they shape and reform uh, the intellectual environment. And of course, they become outstanding academics on their own who, and this is where I will end, who I am grateful to learn from, who teach me new things. So, so the graduate experience is both learning, growing, shaping, inventing, and eventually um, taking thought to new places for which we all can be grateful. I think the opportunity, I've been teaching for a long time, uh, over 40 years, that's too long, I've never been anywhere where the graduate community is so exciting, so interesting, and so dynamic. Welcome to the New School. Um, we're going to have a, a brief panel, and then we'll also give you guys an opportunity to um, talk with faculty and students here. Thank you so much, Jay. So I'm going to introduce our panel. If you guys want to come up, I'll introduce the three of you. All right, so um, we have Wendy Giandra, who is an associate professor of psychology. Her research focuses on the difference between acute trauma, which is like an automobile accident or a single assault, um, and chronic trauma, which is sustained physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. And she runs the Trauma and Effective Psychotherapy Lab. Psychophysiotherapy. Psycho How do you say that? Psychophysiology. Okay, I should have practiced that one. <laughs> we also are joined by our alum, Ethan McCarty. Uh, he received his MA in Liberal Studies. He's currently CEO of Integral Communications Group, a, con a constancy that enables international brands to engage, inspire, and activate employees on behalf of their employers. Previously, um, Ethan worked as the Global Head of Employee and Innovation Communications for Bloomberg LLP. Um, LP, right? LLP is a law firm. LP. LP. I used to be a lawyer, so I should, uh, I should, I should like clear that from my mind. Um, and then Ibrahim Shikaki, who is a PhD candidate at the economics department. He works in the fields of macroeconomics, distribution, and inequality. His dissertation focuses on the political economy of Palestine during the last decade. Um, so they're going to talk a little bit to you guys, and then I'll come back up and give you some more uh, instructions. Good evening. So it's, it's my uh, privilege to uh, be the interlocutor here uh, for this little panel here. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, a super hard-hitting question. Are you ready? <laughs> that was the hard-hitting question. The easy one is, um, why the new school? Um, Wendy, you were, looking, you were making eye contact, so you go first. Um, I feel like I got so much smarter 
by coming here. Um, and so I had already finished my PhD. I'd done a postdoc with a, a world-renowned person. Um, and by coming here, I got so much smarter. Um, so I'm in psychology. And for those of you who have studied in psychology, it's become an increasingly insular discipline. Um, and when I got here, I would have had no idea what Jay was talking about. <laughs> um, and, and so now I feel like I can sit in a room and be with people who toss off comments about Spinoza and what Spinoza is known for and actually be part of that conversation. Um, the, the focus on interdisciplinarity is actually true. I do feel like I have been forced to articulate what I believe and what I understand, which is in some ways an almost fundamental human experience, that's that of trauma. Um, and to be able to articulate that in the most fine-grained detail in ways that both um, that, that scholars who are outside of my discipline and extremely rigorous, but not in my discipline, so needing me to break everything down at a level of detail, truly do understand. Um, so that part, interacting with the across departments, has been fabulous here. I think another part of why NSSR has to do with who we draw here and what it's like to be here. Um, to choose grad school in New York, you have to have a, an adventurous spirit, I think. Um, and the students who we draw here um, are often not cookie cutter students who would have been successful anywhere. I went to this um, prestigious and boring graduate program. Um, and the people who are there are, you know, they're grinding out papers and they're doing their work. Um, but it's not as exciting as here. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so excitement, getting yeah. smarter. And then, but these were factors in your decision and also the interdisciplinary. And, and being here has made mm -hmm. that um, become something that's incredibly apparent as well. So uh, the, all of this stuff is stuff that's on the website, in, but in terms of feeling it and being here, there is something you will, you might be many things while at, you're at the new school. You might be really frustrated. You might be really poor. Um, you might be inspired. You might be generative, but you will never be bored. Ibrahim. Why did you choose the new school, and why don't you leave? <laughs> I'm leaving in a few months, actually. Okay, so then. <laughs> I got it. Well, you haven't left yet, <laughs> so yes. So, so what brought you here, and, and why do you stay? Well, I mean, the economics department at the, the new school is actually one of the few uh, departments that we call heterodox department. That means that not only do we study mainstream uh, uh, neoclassical economics, but we also study um, Marxian political economy and post-Keynesian economics and other approaches. Now, you don't have to know what these other things are, but um, basically it means that we look at economics not as a hard science, right? Not that it, this place where you have laws and you look at relationships between variables. But we go back to what economics really is, which is a social science. It has to do with humans. It has to do with human behavior and interaction. Um, I also came here because I was pissed. Um, <laughs> Yes. This, this Wait, in the American sense or the British sense? <laughs> no. I was One leads the other. In, in the Palestinian sense, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was this satisfied. Uh, um, and I remember two uh, very distinct moments in my life. One, I was like 14, 15, and I was working in this small pillow factory, Palestinian pillow factory. And we would work, and at the end of the week, um, the Israeli subcontractor would get those pillows pillows from us. And I would be so pissed that when my mother would go buy those same pillows, she would pay so much more than what I was paid as a worker. And later on, I would discover, and, and Will Milberg was here, who's an expert on global value chains, that this has to do with the idea of value chains and where mm. value added uh, is. But the second part when I was pissed is after I graduated in Palestine working in economics, I would get these experts from international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF basically trying to give me this one-size-fits-all policy about Palestine. I, I wasn't satisfied with that. And I almost gave up on economics until I heard about the New School and about the heterodox work, the focus that we give not only, again, on this neoclassical approach, but the importance of history of economic thought, economic history, institutions, politics, the political economy approach that is not just combining politics and economics, but talking about class, power, money. This is what matters in the world, and this is what I wanted to study, and, and that's why I came. You know, I can really relate to that. When I, uh, <clears throat> when I was evaluating programs for a master's degree, I was um, just 
uh, sort of starting my career as a manager of other people uh, for a company that is famous for uh, really repressive systems of management, IBM, um, and I was suddenly going to be a part of that, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise to me, in fact. And um, I did not feel well e equipped uh, to understand the dynamics because I had always I'd spent my entire career as somebody who was making things and being managed, and then suddenly I was in this management uh, process, and I felt a fair bit of discomfort with that. And uh, at the same time, I was surrounded by many other IBM, we called ourselves IBMers, uh, people who work at IBM still call themselves IBMers, and I uh, was very, very keenly aware of a homogeneity of thought and just, you know, the kind of end of history thought that, you know, this is just going to, this capitalism, democracy, you know, Reese's Pieces, chocolate peanut butter thing is going to just go forever and we're all good, um, so long as you're on the top. And I wasn't really comfortable with that. And so I sought out programs um, that would allow me to meet people um, who were from outside of my um, sort of universe and also to engage with ideas that maybe I didn't, as a, you know, Ohio boy, come up reading. And so that uh, what you were saying before about that exposure to some of the great thinkers was also really important to me. I was living in New York at the time. I was living in the East Village. Um, but I, I know that uh, many people who are coming to this program uh, are not coming from uh, adjacent neighborhoods in Manhattan. <laughs> Um, so I wonder uh, what, uh, so you, you came all the way from across the ocean. I don't know where you're from, but we'll Ohio. go from Ohio as well. Okay, so another Ohio Go Buckeyes. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. But um, why New York? I mean, like I, I, you explain the appeal of the program, but yeah. why New York? Well, I mean, so two parts, right? The first is, is actually academic. Not only am I at the new school, but I mean, you have basically Columbia, NYU, uh, CUNY, City University of New York, all within 15 minutes, basically, uh, if the subway is running. You know? <laughs> um, Big if. But, but, but aside from that, I mean, obviously, yeah, obviously not the non-academic part, I mean, it's New York, what is there to say? I mean, it's, it's a place where there's something for everybody. Uh, if you're interested in art, if, I mean, even if you're interested in nature, just go 10 minutes upstate and, yeah. and, and, and you'll see. But the food- If the teleporter is working. <laughs> <laughs> the food here yes. is absolutely wonderful. Uh, my wife and I, every few weeks, we go to a place with a different cuisine. I actually have an Excel sheet. You know, that's the, the economist in me. Whoa. An Excel sheet of like the places that we go to and what is our ranking and how much it, it costs over there. <laughs> yeah, I want to see that. Um, but no, I think um, uh, that probably relates to one of the most things that I like about it's New York, which is city, yeah. diversity. Yeah. Um, did you know that in Queens, there are 138 languages spoken. It is the most diverse urban area in the world, Queens, 20 minutes from here. When you're here, don't stay around the city. Go all around. Uh, it's, it's really nice. So I think it's, it's a combination of both of the academics and I mean, being around all these people and, and being around all these interesting people and conferences going on. But also, the other part is, is, is very, very important. I, uh, you know, I used to watch Friends. People still know that, right? Yeah, know yeah. But you know, it was, you know, I, I, the New York appeal was definitely there. It's got a brand. <laughs> Wendy, a fellow Ohioan, oh my gosh. Where from, why New York? Uh, well, I grew up in Cleveland and I actually went to Michigan. Um, so sorry about that. Um, uh, and why New York? Okay, so a couple different things and I'll say the personal and the professional as well. Um, so professionally, um, being in New York and, and as a psychologist, it, there's been a great opportunity for research that I wouldn't have been able to do if I weren't here. Um, first, straightforwardly, I can recruit participants much more quickly than people in other places. The opportunity for studying mental health is actually much easier in New York than it is in other places. Um, but that's led to sort of unexpected and beautiful surprises. One example of that um, is that um, I had a, a sizable grant. It's one of, it's a sizable neuroimaging study. And we made a choice early on in the grant, which was, unorthodox for a neuroimaging study, which was to not inc exclude people who did not um, identify as gender binary or gender conforming. Um, so we have accidentally um, about 15% of our sample in this study of folks who identify as gender nonconforming in one way or another. Why is this meaningful? 
Why does this matter? The NIH doesn't rec recognize gender nonconforming as a status. It doesn't recruit, it doesn't include gender nonconforming status as a category of diversity. So we actually have the data to be able to say why this is, from a health disparities point of view, a group of people who deserves to be included and deserves to be recognized in a study. Um, we could do that because we had so much ease recruiting in New York. So that's just an accident mm. um, of being here. Um, but really, very much to the point that Ibrahim was making yeah, about diversity. Absolutely. I mean, right outside the door here. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then I would also say in terms of what it's like being here, it's not just that it's diverse. Like, Boston is diverse, but that everyone actually embraces the diversity, or at least there's more embracing of the diversity here than there is in other places, um, which is that people who you wouldn't profile as liking art museums like art museums. People go to the orchestra. Everyone is engaged. Everyone goes to the parks. Everyone goes to the different restaurants. It's a place where people are adventurous about exploring. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, because it can be a tiring place to be, but what it's like for me to be here um, is that, the, so what I feel about New York um, is that it's it's got its own sort of gears that are turning and its own sort of energy system. And on days when I have it in me, I'm part of that and I'm contributing to it and I am sort of feeding that energy and I'm alive with the city and on days when I don't have it in me I just can step in and the city carries me along <laughs> um, so as an, from a, as an Ohio girl it's sort of comfortable to be able to sort of be quiet and be in my place and nothing I do here is going to ever surprise anybody when I first moved here I remember thinking like I'm going to be like socially daring and like maybe c like pick my nose or something yeah, right. and nobody will that is not the most shocking thing anybody will ever see in the course of a day <laughs> so no one will ever notice. we won't it. ask for a demonstration no uh -huh. no i'm good um but but the idea that you can just be who you are here and it doesn't you're fine and it's absolutely. fine absolutely absolutely and and i'll say i mean if there's one thing that new york is great about it's dating guys <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. Not, don't come to New York for the dating. Um, but I, I do definitely re uh, relate uh, to what both of you said. Uh, so much of what has kept me in New York, and I've had many opportunities to leave. I've been here for uh, more than 20 years, um, is that energy, the vibrancy, the ability to stumble out of my apartment into a world-class exhibit and so on. Um, intellectually, I've found it to be extremely exciting to be able to work with the best companies that attract the best people. Um, I'm now teaching a class on digital media and, analytic at, uh, and analytics uh, for uh, a master's program at Columbia. The caliber of the people who I interact with every day there is, it's unbelievable. Um, and it's all on the same subway line as my home, which is um, really, really incredible and I think uh, extraordinary and, and differentiating to the city itself. So um, last question. You've, uh, you know, in the in the course of your uh, your time here, you've um, internalized ideas. You've interacted with new kinds of people. Of course, those things don't happen in isolation. How do you see uh, what your experience has been so far at the new school affecting uh, these kind of other dimensions of your life as a professional and as an individual? You can high five over it if you'd like. <laughs> um, well, I mean, first in terms of of what you think. I mean, like I said, okay, so I was this satisfied. <laughs> we we we've established that. But the point was, I had lost faith in economics. So I'm talking to Elijah, right? That's the econ student that's coming <laughs> up here. So I had lost faith in economics. I also was doing my master's around 2008. The crisis was there. Mm. Wow. I basically wow. just thought, okay, lawyers and economists are the worst two people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is going to convince me aside from uh, uh, otherwise. Um, but that is something that definitely changed while I was here. So it brought my faith back in economics, that economics can actually do good, that economics is not just about exploiting people. So that that's kind of like in terms of, of you know, ideas. But it's also, like you said, dealing with people. I mean, being around here and finding so many like-minded people but from so many different places that I've never uh, met or, or you know, places that I've never been before is really one of the most interesting places. And what I really like here, I hear from other people in other universities that especially in economics, it's very competitive and people are like always, you know. But you know, what I found here from my first class that I took here, Advanced Microeconomics 1, that <laughs> lovely uh, <laughs> subject, that we would always, from very first class, we would sit down in, in study groups. We would work together. 
We would study for exams together. Even when we have our qualifying exams in the end, everybody is willing to provide you with their study guide that they worked on for months and months. So I, I, which, you know, is, again, from an economics perspective, from a rational perspective, is quite weird because you have a small, like the, the market, just for you to know also, Elijah, so if you decide to leave now, you can. The market for us is a little bit small, right? I mean, the market for heterodox economists is not as large as of the neoclassical. So we'd actually, uh, you would think that there would be more competition because we have smaller amount of positions to compete against, but it is really the opposite. I'm sure you're going to, well, everybody, not just Elijah. I'm sure you're going to see that uh, uh, here in all our departments. That's so. fantastic. Collaborative uh, yeah. in a surprising way to yeah. you. Wendy. So, and um, the two dimensions come to mind with that. So one is the, the academic, what have I discovered because I followed what students thought was interesting. Um, so one thing I discovered is that actually, uh, that my student discovered, my student Steve Fried discovered that shame is actually more central to PTSD than fear, which is classified as a, mm. peer dis a fear disorder. So that, because I followed my student um, and his wish, we discovered that. Um, another example of something we study, we discovered because I followed my students' interest, people would rather shock themselves than sit alone in a room with their thoughts or than try to think about solving their problems. Mm. <laughs> they would rather administer painful electrical stimulation than think about their own thoughts. Um, and the third um, example of something I discovered because I, or I was part of discovering because of following, that's my student Ashley Dukas. Um, the third piece, uh, student um, Aliza Monti, um, we can't, this is, sorry, um, I'm going to actually say trigger warning before this one, this is because I do trauma work. Um, we can differentiate um, uh, things about who has and hasn't experienced trauma on the basis of characteristics in their voice that are analyzed by a computer. The only other thing that we found that can um, differentiate their voices are people who have actually already assaulted someone. Isn't that terrifying? Yeah. Um, so yeah. because I've, I've given my students a wide berth um, and let them explore what's, what's powerful to them, I've gotten to be part of these cool things. The other thing that's been critical for me, my students keep me not just honest but authentic. Um, uh, the new school is good at many things. Uh, financial aid isn't always the best. And so I am very invested in being sure that my students are getting um, what they came here for, and that's good quality caring mentorship. Um, so my students are family. We've done really embarrassing karaoke together. Um, they've been over for Christmas. Um, my student breastfeeds in my office. Like there are people who are, the, my students are, are family to me. And um, so that, and that keeping an eye on helping not just them do something impactful but being sure that every moment of their time is being used to something that's meaningful meaningful and part of what's meaningful is the care that they get the feeling of being seen um, their their brilliant ideas are great but I want what I want them to walk away with is being cared about um, so that's um, that's I think part of what my experience here ha with students has been it's like really powerful and a powerful change for you and and a powerful you know shared experience with your uh, with your students as well. Um, you know, just to, you know, as a final note here to answer my own question, uh, so much has changed away just in the way that I see the world, in the way I see uh, the dynamics between organizations and their people, um, that it affected the, 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 the reading that I did here, the writing that I did here. I mean, I became a better writer, you will hear. Um, but the reading that I did here um, totally changed the way I see the relationship between people and work. And it led me to uh, excel in my role at IBM, even at, while I was a fly in the ointment there. It led me to a role working for Mike Bloomberg, which was a very exciting period of my life. He's also somebody who went to school here, though I don't think he matriculated. He did take some classes. Um, and then um, it led me to found my own company uh, where we try to work with big employee populations and try to find ways for companies to do better by their people so that their people can do better by the company and feel like they're you know, having productive, meaningful work in their lives. Um, so when I think about what it changed for me, it changed everything. Um, a round of applause for the panel and Dana, back to you. Ibrahim to tell you guys what his new position is because he, 
I asked him to, but yeah. you're gonna. I, I, I did graduate, and we do have jobs. So uh, <laughs> well, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm going to be assistant professor at Trinity College in Connecticut. Yes. Yeah, so, so yes, exactly. He's graduating. He's graduating this year. Thank you. Thank you all so much.